Hello, everyone, uh, and welcome to our virtual town hall Climate Mobilization Act now. My name is Andreas Benzing, and I'm executive director of New York Pacific House. I'm very happy to see so many people today. Uh, it, it's an exciting time uh, to uh, join. It is my honor uh, to welcome Manhattan Borough President uh, Gail Brewer today. Gail is a big supporter of Passive House, and we hope to collaborate together with her and City Council going forward. So welcome, Gail, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Andreas, and thank you to everyone at Passive House Conference. It's always an honor to be here. Um, Andreas, you're always good at making Passive House easily understandable and to make people want to build more energy efficiently. I want to just give you one story that um, I participated in yesterday and another one during the pandemic. So yesterday, some of you may have been there, but I do think that uh, Trinity Wall Street is doing a great job as a developer. And at 555 Greenwich Street, um, they have uh, had a groundbreaking yesterday. You will know better than I if it's actually Passive House. I think it might, they say it's Passive House Plus, and they say that Local Law 97, this will make the Department of Buildings happy and everyone else that it meets those criteria and more. It's obviously going to be a commercial building with lots and lots of community space. So it was exciting and they could give you lock, stock and barrel as to all the things they're doing, but it was very exciting. And then second, in 2020 during the pandemic, as Andreas knows, um, we were working with Pratt, which of course is a recycling company in Staten Island. I love Pratt. They are um, like better than a museum. You go there and you see all of the amazing things that they're doing for our city in terms of recycling. But in addition, um, they have been working with all the community boards and they said to the community boards, let's have a competition. Who can recycle most? And so we had several competitions. I think we have three or four of them and different community boards came in on top. Who can recycle the most in terms of your community? And when you did, you got money as a community board and then you could give it to a nonprofit in your area. So they were pretty competitive. I have to say they really got into it. Um, and so when Community Board 5, which is Midtown, won second place in the first quarter of the Manhattan Paper Challenge, that's what it was called, they chose New York Passive House as the organization to give $3,000 to. And that was so great. And uh, Andreas uh, talked at the uh, sort of ceremony. I think it was all just like this on Zoom. And he said paper can be repurposed as insulation for the construction of energy efficient buildings. So here we are, the world is small, paper recycling and energy efficient buildings. Only Andrea could come up with that. But I just want to say um, that was a big deal. And what it said was not only is Passive House doing a great job, but you're also being recognized even at the local level. I, that was really a big deal because they could have picked anybody. Um, we also worked with um, Mommy Jung, who's a board member and uh, part of, we, we love her because she's part of NYCHA's uh, energy. She's vice president of energy and sustainability. Perhaps she has the hardest job of anybody on this Zoom. I'm gonna be honest with you. She does a great job. She's trying really hard to transform NYCHA buildings with solar panels and boilers and upgraded heating and ventilation system and weatherization retrofits and trying to get rid of the rats because when you get rid of the rats, it's all because you're doing a great job on being energy efficient and sustainable and dealing with the garbage. Um, she's doing it all and she's such a star. Um, and so we all know that um, how New York is doing. I think COVID did stall some development project, but it didn't stop uh, construction completely. And so uh, passive house construction is continuing. I wanna say that in, um, 2021, again, another good story. There are a lot of good stories. I attended the ribbon cutting of the brand new uh, building at 515 East 86th Street, and that's a passive house residential. It has 25% set aside for affordable units, even some at the low 40% AMI, which is medium income. And then I talked a little bit about Greenwich and all the work that they're doing in terms of being uh, close to, if not succeed, so, surpassing uh, passive and also being part of local law um, 97. So there's a lot of good work going on. Um, I also met, and you know him better than I, Greg, who works for NYSERDA, mm -hmm. and he's been in all of these 
And now he uh, is going to be going, I hope, to some of the community boards to be more specific on how NYSERDA can help them as they plan for their neighborhood. So there's so many good things coming out of the work that you're doing. It's incredible. I know that people, it's really, it's a draw to have people uh, who want to live in well insulated uh, buildings, getting rid of the outside pollutants, having indoor ventilation that is excellent. I don't know that when you started Passive House, you realized how important the work you would be doing because now of course it is the number one issue uh, given COVID and all the low energy costs. And of course, what we want to do is save the environment. So we have reached a point where net zero energy buildings aren't just desired, they are now justified. Um, we are also uh, talking in upper Manhattan um, about the Riseboro Inwood building. That's another building. And of course, anything that builds passive house and affordable is number one on my list. Um, it's quiet and that's what's equally important in our crazy, crazy environment in this very large city. This building in uh, Upper Manhattan is 100% affordable. Future operation savings will maintain its affordability for many, many decades. And in 2020, the organization analyzed the building's operational data and found that the use of passive house methods resulted in an energy performance savings of $85,000 per year. So like that kind of data, de developers are able to validate what many of you know for a very long time the passive house construction consistently saves energy costs. And that's what's so exciting about what you're doing. So now what you have to do, we all have to do is build a track record out of existing passive house buildings, energy performance, because then we have the solid data needed to use as a rationale for energy projections for future developments. I am very uh, optimistic that agencies like HBD will more broadly allow for its financing to accept lower energy cost estimates and highly efficient projects. And that means lower upfront development costs and potentially more units of affordable housing. In my role as borough president, all we do, to be honest with you, is land use, land use, land use. And it is frustrating sometimes because you ask these questions and you don't get the answer that you want, which is passive house, passive house, energy efficiency. I can't tell you that I always get it, to be honest with you. Um, and of course, there's local law 97. We know, and you'll hear more from DOB and others, requiring buildings over 25,000 square feet to meet more stringent greenhouse gas emissions by 2024. We already have, understandably, the development community, the owner community, the real estate community uh, concerned about it, and they're contacting us. But we must reduce our carbon emissions in our city by 80% by 2050. And all you need to do is look what's going on in the world and say, this is a priority. And I think passive house is the way to do it. It's also an equity issue. New York City needs to know how to support building owners who do not have the resources to comply, even if they want to. And that's where some of your ideas are important. We've all spoken with small rent stabilized buildings, um, even, and all the way up to the Catholic Diocese and certainly all of the faith-based establishments are calling me because they own beautiful structures that leak energy like it's this. They all have the benchmarks and they all have the numbers that it's going to cost, but they should pay more attention to you. There are some gaps that are real, but the, and the city needs to identify and target which owners to support. There's enough federal money to do, I don't know what with, so this would be the time to do. Um, and I, but I think your expertise on this Zoom is really what they need, because knowledge is the resource. Your collective expertise here will generate actionable ideas that will benefit a wide array of property owners. We need to be a green city, a resilient city. That's another whole topic about resiliency, but I won't get into it now. Sustainable city. Um, we need to live, work, and play in a green city, a resilient city, and a sustainable city. But I just want to congratulate you because in a very short period of time, given how long I've been around, Passive House has really become something in the dialogue. And I think I gave you some examples and there are many, many others, but it's really gotten into the discussion and what I would consider the buzz of the neighborhoods. So thank you to New York Passive House for this convening to move us forward. And I always want to thank Bob Sheck from Community Board One because he is also your great ambassador on the street. 
Thank you very much. And I look forward to listening to what everyone has to say. Thank you. Thank you, Gail, for your continued support of Passcos. Uh, you are our biggest uh, supporter, of course, and we look forward to uh, future collaborations uh, and hopefully there will be plenty of opportunities to collaborate on Passcos. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gail. Thank you. I would like to give you all a, a quick overview of the, over the agenda. We will first have a local law 97 policy overview, uh, followed by three presentations showing the intersection of local law 97 and passive house. And at around 1 p.m., uh, there will be a panel discussion, followed by breakout rooms where you can then interact with the panelists, uh, put your questions in the chat box, unmute yourself, and really ask questions. Uh, and finally, at around 2 p.m., we will come together in small groups for a fun and open networking session. So it should be fun. Uh, stay tuned, please. That's all live. It is my pleasure to welcome Carl Ian Graham, Deputy Director of uh, Building Emissions at the New York uh, City Department of Buildings. Ian's team is responsible for implementing and enforcing Local Law 97. So that is, of course, a very complex task, and we are happy uh, that Ian will give us a Local Law 97 policy overview. Thanks, Ian. It's, uh, it's yours. Um, yeah, thank you so much for this opportunity uh, to talk about Local Law 97 and really the building emissions law, uh, particularly in con concert with Passive House and all the great work you do. Basics. So we're going to go over very quickly uh, the basics of Local Law 97, where it started from. And, and kind of how to prepare for it, which I think a lot of the folks on this call may already know about, but I think it all always bears repeating. Um, and to, to a little bit of history and context. So back in 2009, uh, there were a suite of local laws, 84, 87, 85, 86, 88. 84, 87, and 88 are probably most directly related to sort of where local law 97 kind of was headed. Uh, it was the first sort of uh, salvo of, of uh, laws that indicated that the city was moving towards greater sustainability um, in general. Uh, in 2019, uh, several multiple local laws were passed as part of the Climate Mobilization Act, 92 and 94, sort of looking at uh, activating roofs, um, you know, either with PV or green roofs. 95, looking at building energy efficiency grades, which are now being posted on on buildings. People know what they're walking into in terms of where the buildings line up uh, from an energy perspective. Uh, PACE financing uh, is now um, uh, on the horizon for buildings to, to tap into uh, ways to, to finance that. And then local on 97, which, again, which said um, goals for reducing greenhouse gas emissions in the city by 2050. Um, at the same time, at the state level, uh, there's the, the CLCPA or the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. Um, which set its own targets and goals for uh, carbon reduction. And really, and one of the big ones that, that, that's supporting the city and in, in, in what's going on is getting to a, a much cleaner uh, electric energy grid. Uh, so, you know, a 70% uh, uh, target for renewables by 2030 and trying to get to 100% carbon free by 2040. Um, in the law itself, Right, so going back to and as well right now, so there's the state goal, and really also, also you know, um, uh, you know, President Biden and the federal government are all working hard now to improve the infrastructure in the nation. Again, focusing on on, on climate and carbon reduction. Now, let's, getting back to local law 97. So inside local law 97, there are multiple targets for performance that have been set. Then citywide targets for a 40% reduction by 2030 and 80 by 2050, okay? For covered buildings under the law, a 40% reduction by 2030. There are targets for city operations specifically. Uh, and again, getting to 40% reduction by 2025, five years earlier than the 2030 target for covered buildings. We'll talk about a little bit more. And then a 50% uh, by 2030. So, so, uh, 40% sooner, 50 and going beyond that by 2030, as well as establishing targets for NYCHA, uh, 40 by 2030 and 80 by 2050, okay? Um, and when we talk about Local Law 97, I think we kind of use the term uh, generically, but really it's a building emissions law and a series of laws, um, <clears throat> as well as other local laws. So there's a cleanup law, 
There's natural gas um, uh, laws that, that affected, you know, way natural gas fuel cells are handled, redefined rent regulated accommodations, and actually added some DLB outreach reporting uh, requirements as well. So, so local law 97 is really a, a bunch of uh, local laws together now, which have revised the original language. I, I pointed out only because, you know, we at the department see questions come in, which still reference the original version of local law 97, not understanding that things have changed a little bit. So, so being aware of the fact that this is a law sort of in transition and, and refinement and improvement as we go. And we'll talk a little more, more about what that means. So on the timeline, uh, you know, 2019, the law was passed. We are right at the, the deadline points of the high emissions uh, and not-for-profit healthcare adjustment applications, which literally uh, not-for-profit healthcare application uh, adjustment applications were due this past Wednesday, yesterday, um, <clears throat> as well as having future uh, reporting requirements. We'll get a little more in detail on that. Um, so there's a lot of work and there's a lot of action happening right now under Local Law 97 in the city to develop it and also to start implementing it and start getting uh, things done with it. Um, so it's happening long before 2024 and 2025 and the first reports will be due. So within the law itself, and this is just a subset of, of the, uh, uh, the sections that are in it, uh, there's definitions, uh, there's a section related to advisory board, and there's a, a bunch of uh, information in here about, you know, where the meat and potatoes of the law are sort of in the building emissions section. So we'll go through these sections a bit. We'll focus on uh, uh, the definitions, advisory board limits, uh, penalties <clears throat> today. So the first thing in the definitions that's important to understand is what is a covered building? Now, again, as I mentioned, the law is, it, it, it hits multiple pieces of, of the city code, okay? Um, there are two sections that are created, Article 320, which is the one that a lot of people sort of are focusing on, and then there's Article 321, which we'll talk about later in the presentation. But really, any of the first thing that pops up is, are you a covered building? Is your building a covered building under the law? And if so, under which section of the law? Article 320 or 321? As mentioned earlier, you know, it essentially hits buildings over 25,000 square feet. But if you look at the definitions, actually smaller buildings, if they're on a common lot, where in aggregate they're greater than 50,000, could also be affected by the law and compliance with the law. Um, the thing I think that causes some confusion is this list of exceptions on the right. So you'll see that there are certain buildings which sort of, they think, get off the hook. Well, city buildings we saw earlier actually have their own targets, which are advanced of, of the requirements for uh, that are here, and also NYCHA is exempt from th Article 320, okay, but has its own um, portfolio-wide targets as well. And these last four in bold really will pop up again later in the presentation under Article 320, 321, and others will talk more about that today during the, um, the overall uh, town hall meeting, okay? Um, with respect to an advisory board, it's been convened. It has 19 members. Um, appointed by city council and the mayor's office covering um, defined stakeholder groups. That advisory board has very specific requirements laid out in the law in terms of two reports that have to be written and, and the topics and issues that need to be addressed, looking at the future of the law and, and making it more effective. Um, this advisory board has met and, and convened. It has decided that it, it would like to have eight working groups supporting their activities. Um, <clears throat> Six of those working groups have been have been started, and actually some of them have been, have been actively involved in, in in discussions since last May. So so over a year, um, there are about a hundred plus um, uh, members of these different uh, working groups, and they represent multiple stakeholders across the city. So there's a lot of really bright, talented, hardworking people right now thinking about how to make uh, this law effective and and, and balanced. Right, and and, and uh, equitable, okay? So digging a little bit into the emissions, you know, you get into section 320.3, you find a lot of stuff in there. What you'll find is there are numbers in there for certain uh, compliance timeframes, and then there are directives uh, for the department and the advisory board to consider uh, future uh, values and limits and so forth. So setting new numbers as we go forward. 
Uh, the law lays out emissions limits um, by occupancy groups and then reduces those over time. So the law does become more stringent uh, from a limit standpoint uh, as time goes on. All right. Um, some values that are in the law uh, related to the coefficients of the energy sources that, that buildings use are in there. You'll see there's a lot of TBDs, a lot of things that still need to be worked out uh, and set, uh, which we're talking to um, the folks in the working groups about and, and working on actively now. Um, as well as you know the footnotes and the little in the fine print, uh, other things related to you know how emissions happen from uh, campus systems that are connected or not connected to the electric grid, as well as um, developing a time of use based coefficients for say electricity. Okay. Also within the law, there are there are allowances for deductions related to renewable energy credits, greenhouse gas offsets, uh, and clean distributed energy resources, which is Something is also being developed and, and uh, deliberated on by the, the working group. Okay, uh, an important part of this also, and, and this will come up again and again, uh, when it comes to reporting, owners submit the reports, but they have to be certified by a registered design professional. So getting um, getting you know those architects and engineers actively involved in this discussion is going to be important early on to be sure that you're headed in the right direction and can achieve compliance. Um, uh, there are additional provisions, again, related to um, certain types of housing, uh, income-restricted housing, um, that have different time limits and um, compliance periods. I think we'll hear a little bit more about that later today uh, from the folks at HPD. All right. Um, I, I point out the penalties not to focus on it too much, but just to say that a lot of the local laws in the city, you know, they have sort of, um, there are penalties associated with them, but if you do the math on these, uh, there's some serious teeth here. Uh, the, the penalties um, can be pretty steep depending on the size of the building and the amount of non-compliance. Um, there are uh, penalties in there related to uh, the registered design professionals and their responsibility under the law, um, not making material false statements about what's going on, as well as being late. Um, uh, you know, being late can be pretty costly. If, if there's a million square foot building, it's 50 cents per gross square foot per month for a civil penalty adds up pretty fast. All right, so Article 321, again, broken down similarly, there's definitions, uh, and then there's requirements <clears throat> for compliance, and then there's a reporting section. We'll talk a little bit about that now. And you'll see that that those there are those four exceptions uh, under Article 320, they reappear here, the rent regulated accommodations, religious houses of worship, um, and that laundry list of alphabet soup uh, related to housing development fund corporations of the um, corporate business law and Article 11 of the private housing finance law. I did that all from memory. That's pretty good. Um, as well as project-based federal housing. Again, similar criteria. If you're if those buildings are over 25,000 square feet, or if they're an aggregate, uh, there are multiple buildings on a lot and they in aggregate are greater than 50,000 square feet, you start to have coverage agents that have to uh, comply with the law. Um, <clears throat> there are two compliance paths under Article 321. Okay, one is a performance-based one. Remember that this performance-based one uh, uses the, 20, uh, the 320 limits for 20, 30 to 34. So the more stringent limits under the performance so a lot of what people are talking about are the prescriptive energy conservation measure path. So we'll talk a little bit more about on the next screen. But mind you that these two reports are, are certified by different folks. The first one, if you're following a performance path, is a registered design professional. Otherwise, it's a retro commissioning agent. Okay? Um, and just to kind of show the laundry list of energy conservation measures, it's a long list, right? Um, as applicable to the building. Some of these might be more challenging for certain building types. And again, I think other folks are going to address some of that as we uh, throughout the day. Okay. How do you prepare for compliance? It starts with understanding where you fit in the law, right? And deciding whether uh, your building is going to be subject to Article 320 or 321, or, you know, if it's a NYCHA property, if it's DCAS, if it's other types of city buildings, where they fit and the, the work provisions that they may have to be subject to. And then it really starts looking at when you figure out whether you're under which article or the other, 
starting to do the math. Working with a registered design professional early on is going to be important because, again, it's these the performance values are, are based upon the build, building area broken down by occupancy of the building, okay? So understanding your limit means understanding the way the building is broken down and looking what the aggregated value is for the building as a whole. Second piece of the puzzle is how the building uses energy. And the best way to figure that out is to start doing an energy audit working with professionals, understanding if you've got uh, sophisticated building owners with, with staff that can do this, you know, starting to break down and get a handle on where the energy is going within the building and how it's being used. So you can start to figure out what kinds of things can move the needle in terms of getting towards compliance, okay? Um, and again, thinking ahead, all right? Um, many of the buildings in the city are okay for the 2024 to 2029 um, compliance period from a limit standpoint. However, 2030 is right around the corner. And m many buildings are going to find themselves challenged by the limits in the law uh, for that compliance period. Having enough time to plan that out and get ahead of it is going to be important, right? Thinking about ways to improve the energy efficiency, reducing, reducing carbon intensity of, of the fuels that are being used in the building, switching from fossil fuels to electricity, or uh, are we using the right kind of, of HVAC type of equipment, things like that. Um, considering renewable energy credits or renewables on the building itself, um, greenhouse gas offsets, you know, and so forth. And right now, the, the mayor's office is working on a carbon trading study, um, so that's yet to be seen as to how that would be implemented and rolled out. But again, you know, thinking about compliance and the ways to get there. Start with making the buildings better. It'll help the bottom line as well as help the environment. So finally, as I said, the law has been changing. So local law 97 is in quotes, and now it's a series of local laws to really understand what's going, going on there. Um, staying informed as about what's happening with the progress of the working groups and the uh, advisory board. Uh, if, if you uh, go to our website, the New York City Sustainable Buildings website, is a great uh, one-stop shop for a lot of the information that's out there. You can get access to the, the, the current conformed versions of Article 320 and 321 uh, through links on that website, right, and staying up to date. So hopefully I haven't gone too far over my time, Andreas, and I will pass it back to you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Ian, That was for that really great um, overview and introduction to Local and on 97. I'm Joanne Goncher, a board member at New York Passive House and an editor at Architectural Record. Next, we are going to dive a bit deeper into the application of both Local Law 97 and Passive House with a series of presentations. Jennifer Leone, uh, Chief Sustainability Officer for New York City's Department of Housing, Preservation and Development, will speak about what Local Law 97's implications for affordable housing are. And Elisa Bucher, a partner at Rogers Partners Architects and Urban Designers will be next. She will talk about a 1960s Upper East Side co-op where a facade retrofit has been designed to meet local law 97's carbon limits. And uh, then we will hear from Ryan Cassidy, Director of Sustainability and Construction for Riseboro Community Partnership. He will discuss how his organization has applied Passive House to its development projects. More information about each of the speakers can be found in the event agenda, which is in which uh, was posted in the chat. And then we'll follow the presentations with a panel discussion. Um, Jen, would you like to start? Great. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for including me in this presentation. Um, as was noted, my name is Jen Leone, the Chief Sustainability Officer of the New York City Department of Housing Preservation and Development. Great. So I know that not everybody on this call is um, doing affordable development um, or knows very much about HPD and what we do. So very quickly, um, what HPD, my agency, does is we build new affordable housing, we preserve existing housing, and we enforce the city's housing maintenance code, um, and also work on neighborhood plans through our planning division. Um, you can see a map. This is the work we've done in the, for the Housing New York plan. 
um, under the mayor, and we've developed 300,000 uh, dwelling units or will by 2026. Um, and just a little bit of background on the standards that our projects need to comply with. Um, our new construction and substantial rehabs are required to follow uh, LEED, gold or above, or more typically enterprise green communities. Um, and the moderate rehabs, which we do, and we do a lot of them, um, all complete an integrated physical needs assessment to make sure that energy and water savings are integrated into our project scopes. So that's a little about us. Next. Ian talked about this a little bit, but I thought that it'd be useful to clarify a little bit more what affordable housing is. Um, it seems obvious, but it is pretty nuanced. Um, so affordable housing is an umbrella term that the city uses to refer to housing that either has income restrictions or rent restriction. And these can be imposed by a variety of different programs or laws. Um, Local Law 97 doesn't use the term affordable housing, but uses the terms below. Um, so income restricted, in, uh, sorry, income restricted is describing buildings where the resident's income must be qualified in order to rent or buy um, these homes. Um, and that includes projects in the Mitchell Lama program. And just as a note, most buildings with HPD financing are income restricted. But to make it a little bit more confusing, um, there's also, and Local Law 97 also refers to um, buildings that are rent regulated. Um, and these are buildings that have restrictions on rent increases year to year. Um, and they're more commonly known as rent control and rent stabilization. Um, most rental buildings with HPD financing have units that are both income restricted and rent regulated. Um, but then there's a lot of um, rent stabilized units across the city that are not necessarily income restricted. So this is kind of confusing. I'm gonna walk through how local law 97 um, relates to these different types of affordability. And just a note, about 10 to 15% of New York City's built square footage, according to our calculations, are considered affordable housing that is subject to local law 97. So both affordable, and over 25,000 square feet. Um, so as Ian mentioned, uh, buildings that include affordable and rent regulated housing are not exempt from the law, um, but are treated differently. And there's four key buckets of how these projects um, are treated. Any buildings on land owned by NYCHA. So that includes NYCHA buildings, um, but also projects in their um, RAD and PACT programs um, must uh, look at their greenhouse house gas emissions on a portfolio-wide basis, but these new buildings in the, the RAD Impact program are also subject to Article 321. Um, and as was discussed earlier, Article 321 is the pathway um, for certain buildings that have to either meet the 2030 carbon limits or implement the prescriptive measures. Bucket number two, um, and this is really the Article 321 bucket um, that the RAD Impact programs fall into. Um, again, I'll say it again, just because it's confusing, um, but they have to demonstrate that either their emissions are below the 2030 emissions limits or implement the applicable prescriptive energy conservation measures by 2024. So who does this apply to? This is buildings in which more than 35% of the units are rent regulated. And that is regardless of whether they're income restricted. So if you have a building with both, they fall into this bucket. Um, it also applies to HDFC co-ops. Um, and HDFC, for those of you less familiar, are housing development fund corporations. So it's a particular kind of affordable housing. And finally, buildings with HUD project-based assistance. So we're not talking about um, tenant vouchers, we're talking about um, buildings with these specific programs, most commonly section eight and section 202 that are part of the building. You know, they don't travel with the tenant, they stay with the building. Bucket number three, um, buildings with 35% of units that are rent regulated, sorry, up to 35% of rent regulated. And this was adjusted later, um, I think in 2020. Um, these buildings have to start meeting the 
uh, emissions limits outlined in Article 320 starting in 2026. So a slight delay doesn't start in 2024. Um, and those are not HPD projects. Typically, they are the rent stabilized universe um, outside of subsidized housing. And finally, and possibly most confusingly, there are certain income restricted housing um, buildings that have to start meeting applicable emissions limits in 2035. And this is very unique and it's applicable to covered buildings that are Mitchell Llamas and that contain fewer than 35% of units with rent regulation and one plus one or more units that are income restricted um, under various programs. Um, okay, so how will Local Law 97 impact affordable housing? Um, I think that my uh, statistic might be a little off um, after the previous presentation, but a huge number of existing multifamily buildings are not going to meet the 2030 emissions limits. You know, the newer construction is likely closer um, and more of them will, but most are not going to meet 2030 and almost no buildings that currently exist will meet the long term targets. That said, most HPD projects in particular, so subsidized affordable housing, um, are subject to Article 321, the prescriptive measures pathway. But still, they need to start thinking about the law now. Um, and how will they do that? And I don't have to reiterate this, but in brief, figuring out which pathway they are likely to comply with, right? If they're close to the 2030 targets, that might be the optimal path for that building or start thinking about how to achieve the prescriptive measures. Um, and again, that really needs to be thought of early, right? It's, it's fairly invasive. It means getting into apartment units um, and figuring out a strategy now for 2024. Um, and that includes for projects, you know, being developed or being developed through HPD is making sure that these pathways are selected and that the measures are incorporated into project scopes. Excuse me. Um, and then the Mitchell Llama projects um, and some of these other projects that fall into bucket number four, they have a long time before they have to start complying, but still they need to be thinking about this now because it might affect choices of equipment during emergency repairs or interim maintenance and so on. Um, but one thing I would like to say is that, you know, the city may not be able to meet its 80 by 50 goals if Local Law 97 stays as it, as it is now. Um, laws change all the time and nobody knows if, you know, the building subject to Article 321 will have to start meeting with carbon emissions in the future. We kind of know how to get there if the law expands. Um, this is a study that I was involved in along with uh, an, a number of peers. Many of you may have seen uh, the study through our presentation uh, at Building Energy Exchange, but it's just showing that passive house projects, and I think everybody knows that, right? Passive house projects um, can meet the early uh, local law 97 emissions limits. And the projections show that most passive house projects, particularly passive house projects using um, electric and efficient systems would also fairly easily meet the 2050 emissions limits. And note that this chart on the slide is making an assumption that the grid will be clean by 2050 and that the CLCPA projections are in fact achieved. Um, and I also want to note, of course, that Passive House is not just about carbon and energy. And obviously, speaking to the choir here, there's a lot of benefits of Passive House that are really critical for the communities that we're serving, health, safety, resiliency, and equity. Mm -hmm. Obviously, there are a lot of challenges for implementing long-term local law 97 goals and passive house for affordable housing. Um, just put some, but not all of the barriers on the slide. The cost and complexity, especially for retrofits. It's, you know, we all know that it's not easy um, to bring an existing New York City building to interfit or other passive house standards, um, but we'll hear more about that.
there are potentially higher maintenance and operations costs, at least in the near term, till we figure everything out. Um, there are issues around tenant paid heat and split incentives for the affordable housing sector. Um, there are resiliency concerns around electrification and a overburdened grid. Um, and then other regulatory barriers. And I'm not gonna walk through all of them, but we, you know, we can talk about them in the discussion panel. Um, and then of course, a lot of unknowns. How do we get there? Will the projected savings be achieved? And so on. Um, we're doing what we can at HPD to try and push the needle and make sure that our um, development partners are trying to be future-proof. Um, although our projects have to meet enterprise green communities, which is um, exceeds code in terms of performance, we are pushing for healthier and more efficient buildings. And we're trying to do a lot of things to make that happen, including research, analysis, pilots, education, and so on. Um, and again, it's a really good time, an unfortunate time, but also a really good time to start leveraging this post, or it's not really fair to say post COVID, but you know, current interest in addressing the health and equity of LMI and fence line populations. And we're trying to make sure that we um, really take advantage of that. And we at HPD are interested in making sure that these best practices are um, embedded into our projects so that all of our projects can meet the city's climate goals now and in the future. But again, meeting our own objectives for healthy, safe, and affordable housing in New York City. And obviously, Passive House is the gold standard for how to get there. Um, and that is all I have to say. Um, so hi, um, my name is Alyssa Booker, and I am a partner at Rogers Partners Architects here in New York. And I'm going to present a project that we've been working on now for about two years um, to uh, up, upgrade the facade of an existing co-op building on the Upper East Side. Uh, the building is one of these uh, ubiquitous white brick buildings uh, that was built in the 19, in 1961. And uh, it's actually an, a fairly early example of this building type. Um, and it was the epitome of modern and chic at the time. Um, it, the building has uh, about 160 apartments and uh, they're all very gracious by today's developer standards. The rooms are, are large and comfortable, um, but the developers at the time did not spend their money on the facade uh, besides, besides this idea of, of nice clean white bricks. Um, so we were engaged because um, the, the building for many years had uh, been managing to sort of patch together a deteriorating facade uh, which was deteriorating not because of neglect, uh, but really because the, the building's materials just weren't able to continue to sustain the weather in, in New York. And um, the, rather than uh, just redo the building in brick, which would have been the, the cheapest option, um, they realized that they, this was an opportunity to upgrade uh, the performance of the facade and also uh, reposition the building from a real estate point of view. Um, and so um, we were brought in to uh, really sort of reimagine what the building could look like. Um, and you can see this is just an example of the type of deterioration that they had here. The brick itself is just um, a cracking and, and uh, there were significant leaks and uh, local law 11 was an ongoing headache for the building. They constantly had repairs. And when we were engaged, they had had the sidewalk bridge around their building for something like five years continuously. And it, um, which actually is still there because we're still under construction. Next slide. Um, and when we, we started to do probes and, and uh, look at the condition of the building, it wasn't just the facade, it's a facade brick, but also the block backup that was significantly deteriorated. And um, if you see all these cracks uh, where the mortar has fallen out, 
um, you can imagine the amount of air infiltration that we were dealing with um, and that the building was sustaining uh, just in just you know through the wall itself not even around the windows and it was the type of situation where you know you could put your hand in front of an electrical outlet on the exterior wall and feel the cool air coming in in the winter time and then of course this is the new reality also looking at um, if you're going to redo your facade you really want to take advantage of um, the opportunity to upgrade the building uh, performance to con conform with the new requirements of local law 97. And this is actually not their building, but this is just an example of what we're gonna start seeing all around New York City in the next years, uh, upcoming years. Next slide. So this was not only a technical challenge, it was also a design challenge. Um, when we looked at uh, aesthetically, what kind of opportunities do you have when you're going to up, you're going to redo the facade, but you're not actually going to change any of the openings, and we're not going to make a new, sexy modern glass facade. We've got the openings that we have; these punched openings. And um, we know we're going to be taking advantage of the four inches or eight inches that you can add to the facade without um, incurring any penalty from a FAR point of view. Um, and we were lucky that we didn't have any uh, lot line uh, conditions where we were unable to expand over, uh, expand the building by four inches. Um, so what we did is we um, we used uh, we proposed a rain screen system, and you can see that we have uh, introduced a, a beveled surface above the windows to make to bring out the frame and sort of uh, alleviate that just blank punch window look. Um, and also one of the advantages here is we're adding. The thickness of the window, but not cutting out the, the light from the apartments by uh, beveling in the wall like this. Next slide. Um, and then this was some of the design studies that we did. It's a very quirky building. Um, it had lots of these chamfer corners, which were also very typical of these uh, this building type. Um, and um, we also had uh, we, we worked with the building to come up with strategy about also replacing the windows themselves. And um, the, the cost of this project was very significant, borne entirely by the shareholders of the building. And so they decided to make replacing the windows optional. Um, but that then led to the challenge of uh, designing the window frame system that would permit future access for window replacement. Another view, another uh, design study. Next slide. So this is a diagram showing uh, the existing construction on the left where you have the brick right up against the block uh, with virtually zero space. There was an under an inch of space between the brick and the block backup. And what we are, are currently installing on the building is a new modern facade, which actually does meet passive house standards for air infiltration and insulation. It's a rain screen system over four inches of mineral wool insulation. And we have got a high performance um, waterproofing, also uh, waterproofing membrane between the windows and the wall. So that, um, that if the windows themselves were passive house level windows, um, it would be a passive house level facade. But as I said, the, the um, shareholders elected to make window replacement optional. Um, so this is a rendering of the proposed um, new 
newly clad building. And we um, looked at a couple of different options for our rain screen. Um, the left is uh, precast uh, cement panels and on the right is a uh, custom designed uh, porcelain panel, which is what we ended up going with. Um, we developed this idea of um, uh, sort of pixelating a natural, natural stone pattern, uh, almost like a Chuck Close um, portrait where, you know, when you step back, it looks like stone, but when you get up close, you see these pixels. And it was a way to sort of um, make it uh, almost more, um, almost more of a comment on the, the fact that it's not real stone, but we wanted to have that visual activity of a natural material, but not make it fake. Uh, this is, uh, here we are working with the manufacturer to develop the materials. Next slide. And here we have a mock-up that we built early on. You can see uh, what we're working with here is, is a window trim, metal window trim system that could be unscrewed so that in the future you have access to the waterproofing around the window. So if you need to replace the window in the future, you can get in and replicate the, um, the water and uh, air infiltration closure between the windows and the wall system. Next slide. Uh, so here we are coming in, uh, was very interesting, the, the challenges of working on a building that is occupied. Um, we worked through the winter, we worked through COVID. Um, here we have, uh, you see abatement of um, the window sills, which luckily we're, that was the only place where we did find asbestos in the building. Um, and here you can see they, after they stripped off the brick, they had to um, patch and repoint the block behind it in order just um, to, for, for air infiltration, but really for the structural integrity of the block itself. Next. And here you see their parging on the left, uh, parging the wall, and you also see um, the little vent sticking out uh, that is actually an, an air intake for the unit inside the apartment. Um, and uh, we can talk later about um, the challenges also of dealing with uh, ventilation systems in existing buildings and how that might get upgraded. On the right, you see the roll-on um, waterproofing membrane. And here we have a replacement window being installed. And you can see this is uh, the waterproofing around the window. This is what we would have to get access to in order to get the same level of performance with a future replacement window. And here you have uh, the metal um, framing system being bolted into the masonry wall. Um, we had to custom make these uh, tubes above the windows so that we could get that bevel effect. And here on the right side, you can see the four inches of mineral wool insulation that is slipped behind the tubes after they're installed. And on the right, you see that they're uh, installing, I'm sorry, on the left side, you can see they're installing the porcelain panels. We actually had an exposed clip system, um, which it's, it's amazing actually how quickly it can be installed once you get all of the framing up. Um, the clip system was more cost effective and we transitioned to a concealed clip system in the lower floors of the building. Um, so here you can see this of uh, the, the final window trim being installed uh, and you see the way the tile looks. Next slide. And here we're beginning this in the last couple of weeks to finally take um, the, the scaffolding off of the top couple of floors. And here we are on, on a terrace on uh, the 19th floor. Um, the, the roof in this building is actually very small because all of the, the terraces uh, step in as you go up the building. 
Uh, so we're not utilizing the roof. We're just doing uh, R30 insulation on the roof. Next slide. And here you see, uh, again, this is a view from 79th Street. The scaffolding starting to come down is going to be very exciting. In about a month, we're going to see uh, a lot of the scaffolding coming down. Next slide. And that's the presentation. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, I am Ryan Cassidy from Riseboro Community Partnership. We are an affordable housing developer and uh, project management uh, or property management company uh, based in Brooklyn with uh, sites throughout New York City. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about our passive house work to date and how we're approaching our uh, passive house rehabs, which is uh, new to us. So we've been through most of these, so I won't spend a lot of time on, on this slide, but uh, what's interesting to me is that the, the benefits uh, side has kind of evolved over time for us. Uh, it started with purely like a, a mission driven, uh, you know, reduction in energy and bringing in the, those uh, highly efficient buildings at the same cost. And it's really expanded to these, uh, especially these health and comfort issues that we've heard about, um, interior air quality, uh, consistency and temperature, noise attenuation, pest control, and really looking at passive house buildings, not only as an, as an energy metric, but as a quality building metric. And that's how we, we think about it now. And that's why we uh, have passive house as our basis of design for all of our new construction projects. So we are a, a affordable housing nonprofit company. So we do have a triple bottom line approach to our business. Uh, so we can see here, you know, there's environmental things that are a little bit larger uh, than just our day-to-day -day, uh, buildings in our in our footprint and uh, social and economic issues. And, and Passive House really do does cover all of these uh, issues as we've uh, heard from uh, Borough President Brewer this morning and uh, some of the other presentations. You may notice that affordable housing seems to be on the leading edge of this, and I think there's a pretty good reason, and that's uh, because without the uh, without the real estate tax burden that market rate housing has, uh, utilities have a much bigger impact to our bottom line than a typical uh, market rate building, and because we cannot uh, paper over um, operational expenses with rent increases, we're really confined to this very tight a palette of what we can do on an existing building. So we can't raise rents, our operating costs are what they are. So if we can, if we can decrease those, it really makes uh, these buildings uh, sustainable for the long term. And that's financially sustainable as well as sustainable from an energy perspective. We developed a uh, tenant in place rehab to the passive house standard. And uh, this was a ambitious project that we started probably now about five years ago in design. We are two years into construction, but this is one of the buildings uh, shown uh, through the energy retrofit planning report lens. And you can really see the dramatic uh, savings that we're talking about in operations. So we're down there at package number four, uh, 80 to 84% reduction in our uh, utility operations. So from the uh, lens of an affordable building where you're spending nearly half of your budget on utilities, if you can cut that by 80%, it makes, uh, makes these projects really attractive. Uh, the project itself we called uh, Casa Pasiva. Um, it is nine buildings, 146 units. And this is kind of like the summary tab of our model versus underwriting. And one of the keys to getting these projects uh, executed, both in a new construction environment and with a renovation, is getting your underwriting to savings. And so you can see in each of these, there's three scenarios shown here. Um, and in each scenario, we have our two standards that we would normally underwrite to, uh, either HDC or, or Sony Ma, and then we have our modeled uh, projected savings. So you can see that these are radical uh, operational savings. We're not talking about 10%, 20%. Um, we're talking about really uh, dramatic savings. And my next slide will we'll go into what, what you can do and how you can leverage those types of savings. Um, these three groups of uh, bar graphs really just show uh, the first is the modeled uh, performance at 32,000. The next we tweaked a little bit to show 
maybe more accurate uh, performance on our air source heat pumps. So a little bit lower COP than the manufacturer says they can deliver. And then the last is where we landed with our lender, which is around 50% savings uh, of the model. So you can see some, you know, we're not capturing all of the savings and that was because our, our lending partners like to have a little protection, um, but it's still a dramatic uh, decrease in uh, operations. So what can we do with those dramatic savings and operating costs? So this is a, a typical like sources and uses uh, calculation that we would do on the development side. And we can see that the, the small uh, savings in operating costs um, here is, is showing a 50% reduction can really leverage into some big numbers uh, when it comes to our sources. So in this particular case, we have increased our bank loan and we have decreased our subsidy ask, um, which the agencies like because the subsidy is at a premium for these projects. And then if the bank is gonna underwrite to less operations, we can have a larger uh, bank loan to cover uh, our hard costs or, or other project costs. So you know, even a 50% reduction that looks small uh, leverages itself into quite a bit of capital on the sources side. So here's our a little more detail on, on how we did these uh, passive house renovations. So we used, uh, some of this is affordable housing language. Um, we used a, a year 15 financing method. Um, the story really for any project is to have a financial moment in the building. And that may be under local law. It might be a re-underwriting of existing debt. Um, but if you have an existing financial moment that you're, that you're working with, it allows you to get these maybe larger types of scope in place. And that's what we did. We had an opportunity to flip a bunch of our older poor performing buildings into a tax credit project. And so we took that opportunity and created this uh, passive rehab. So these were moderate rehabs with tenants in place, which are its own set of challenges. Although I think going to the passive house uh, model actually saved us uh, some grief with the tenants because we ended up doing a lot of the work from the outside of the building. Um, whereas if we did our typical upgrades, we would have been doing much more of the heating cooling systems uh, within the units. We underwrote to savings as I, I spoke about, we got some gap financing uh, from NYSERDA, which helped us close the project. We we're designed to the FIA standard and uh, we are pre-wired for solar, but we don't include it in our uh, baseline underwriting because we like the building itself to perform uh, without any renewable and then use our renewable to push us closer to net zero. So these are just some of the means and methods. Um, we, we're flipping from uh, steam buildings to uh, a VRF uh, air source heat pump system with ERVs. So, um, you know, we, we're getting much better controlled and efficient distribution of our heating and cooling. And then we're adding uh, EFIS to our exterior walls. Um, before we add that EFIS, um, we are running all of our new duct work and all of our new line sets for our heating and cooling on the outside of the building. And then we're cladding all of that in EFIS. This is kind of like a, a blowout of the scope of work. So you can see in the color on the outside, our new moisture and vapor barrier is going on the existing brick wall. Uh, we're doing new windows and then we're putting in those new line sets and duct work that are going into the units um, and then cladding all of that with a new coating. On the inside of the apartment, um, we're, we're still doing the full kitchen and bathroom remodel that you would see in, in like a typical preservation product, uh, project. We're doing all those interior doors, flooring. So all those challenges remain the same. Um, instead of dealing with like balancing uh, existing heating and cooling systems, we're taking those out and we're doing the, the wall hung units, um, which are a nice, uh, a nice feature because it frees up some floor space, especially if you've got um, these really hot radiators um, in your in these smaller rooms, you're taking those out and you're replacing with a wall hung unit. It frees up floor space and obviously makes the apartment uh, a lot more uh, consistent with temperature. One of the interesting things here is that with the ERVs, um, we put them on the existing uh, exhaust vents. So we took off our existing exhaust fans and, and kept that as our exhaust. And then uh, the new ducts on the outside of the building are for supply. So we're supplying uh, fresh air uh, into the bedrooms and living spaces and keeping those existing exhaust uh, chases and putting an ERV on top where the uh, exhaust fan used to be.
So of course, what about costs? Because that's what, uh, you know, once we get through these technical issues, that's what everybody cares about. These are new construction buildings, but I just wanted to use them as an example of kind of how we got into uh, Passive House and why we were able to stay ahead of the curve. If, you know, I haven't mentioned Local Law 97 because it's our goal to produce buildings that are compliant out to 2050, as uh, Jen Leone mentioned from HPD, that Passive House can get you there. So we don't spend a lot of time thinking about codes or chasing the code or reacting to the code because it's our goal to be so far in front that we don't ever have to think about it. So these are some examples of projects that we did. Uh, these two uh, were completed in 2013 and 2014 at cost per square foot that I can only uh, dream about now, but you know, 225 to 235 a square foot, uh, all in hard cost. Um, they're both uh, passive houses designed by Chris Benedict, and she's the one that kind of introduced us to um, these types of buildings uh, nearly 10 years ago now. Next slide. These are two of our newer buildings, um, also with pretty uh, uh, affordable uh, completion costs, again, all in, including contingencies, uh, 232 at Our Lady of Lords and 306 at Atlantic East that's just finishing up uh, in the next couple of weeks with the TCO. These are big multifamily buildings using uh, two pipe uh, VRF systems with uh, unitized ERV and uh, to the passive house standard. So we're, we're producing these really great buildings at affordable costs and also capturing all the benefits um, that I talked about earlier uh, with health and safety. So that's it for me. I uh, look forward to the breakout rooms. Thank you. Thank you, Jen, Alyssa, and Ryan for those really informative presentations. Now I'd like to introduce Stash Zakshevsky. He's president of New York Passive House Board and a principal at ZH Architects and a member of the Local Law 97 Advisory Board that was mentioned earlier by Ian. Stash will moderate a discussion among Jen, Alyssa, Ryan, as well as Ian. Stash, take it away. Thank you very much. Uh, Joanne, and thank you uh, to everyone who is attending today. This is um, such an important topic. Um, I have to say that um, I had previously uh, acted as um, an advisory board member on the Energy Code, and uh, I'm very happy to be serving um, on the Local Law 97 uh, advisory board. And I have to say, um, and, and Ian alluded to it earlier in the presentation, uh, with over 100 people, um, really some bright minds who are jumping in on this and giving a lot of their time uh, to this effort. It's, it's, it's a huge endeavor. So uh, a big thank you to all of those people and also to the DOB for uh, wrestling this uh, very difficult uh, topic. So. With that being said, um, thank you for those uh, great presentations. Um, I'm going to jump in with, with some questions um, and then we can uh, obviously going into the breakout rooms, uh, dive into more detail. So um, I think the first question I have um, is for Alyssa. Um, so this is a, a really beautiful project uh, that you've 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 been working on here, and your team. And um, you know, a lot of times when we look at different buildings that are going to be uh, retrofitted for energy efficiency measures, uh, a lot of the times people say, "Well, let's attack those uh, low lying that low lying fruit, the mechanical systems, lighting, things like that." And what's interesting about your project is you've jumped in at the deep end and. <laughs> You, you've you've you're just dealing with the facade, which is usually this the 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 next item to be dealt with, and I understand that there were some issues uh, there with local law eleven, but I'd like you to maybe talk to that and and I noticed there were some um, ventilation uh, within the facade, but I, I'd love to hear a little bit more about that and um, and about how you dealt with that in the project. Um, well, we uh, we uh, uh, just tackling the mechanical part first. Um, we brought in uh, Dagger Associates engineers, whom I think you know, um, to help us um, really sort of understand what, what, what would be the low-lying fruit, if you will, uh, for the mechanical systems. And um, 
the the building has um, units under the windows with uh, air intake, and then the exhaust is through the primarily through the bathroom exhausts. Um, they um, the the air, however, was really unregulated in all of those areas. So that the brick vent, which is about two inches by 10 inches on the exterior facade was just open, completely open. And so especially in the winter, uh, you'd have a stack effect in the building so that all of the um, lower level apartments had enormous amount of, of air coming in. And when we opened up and they did some uh, you know, investigation, they found that most of the tenants on the lower floors had actually stuffed the ducts full of socks and newspapers and stuff to, to, because of the, the draftiness problem. And what we ended up doing, and this was uh, an innovation that was introduced by Dagger, um, was installing these dampers that basically um, limit the CFM coming through, um, but it's, it's a mechanical device. It's not an electrical damper of any kind. It's just based on air pressure. And we also installed the same thing then in the bathroom exhausts. So you really um, bringing a, a smaller uh, amount of air through. Now, that being said, um, the, there's also, you know, space under the apartment doors, you know, it, it, so there, there would be no ability to have a blower test on an apartment at this point. Um, the building had already uh, changed all, all of their lighting to LED, and they did this several years ago. Mm. Um, the building is on uh, Con Ed steam. Uh, it's a direct steam heat system, and then they have a steam powered chiller for air conditioning, and they have steam for domestic hot water. And so I don't, I, we've talked about that it gives you, you know, less ability to uh, select sustainable energy um, sources, right, if you're on the steam system. So the, I think Con Ed's also going to have to come to reckoning about their own power generation in that respect if they want to keep an inherently efficient steam system in, in Manhattan. Um, so one of the things that's been really interesting about this is um, we're starting to hear from uh, tenants in the building about um, being more comfortable, about how much quieter it is in the, in the apartments, about less draftiness. Um, and I think it's going to be really interesting. We don't have uh, any results yet because the building still wasn't insulated. We were under construction last winter. So this winter, we'll, we'll have the first data to be able to do a comparison uh, with previous years and measure the actual energy savings. The projection that we had based on uh, energy model was that um, the, this retrofit that we're doing here in 2021 is gets us you know, past uh, 2025 and about a third of the way to 2050. Uh, and, and in order to, to go forward from that, and we could look at retrofitting uh, basically an ERV system, but it would require taking the existing uh, exhaust ducts and separating them into supply and return and putting ERVs on the roof where the, the fans are now, the exhaust fans. Uh, and uh, he, they think that the ducts themselves are oversized enough that it's not unrealistic to do that, but it would be fairly invasive from a construction point of view to come in and do that work. Um, but it, it's interesting to everybody to say, okay, like, so what technologies are going to be developed, for example, will there be some way to um, fairly easily turn an existing exhaust system into a circulating system? Um, how can that how can that be? And I think some of some innovation is going to be driven by by necessity here. Yeah, no, they're great points, and I know that every any time I've 
gone to the Passivaz conference in Europe, I've seen all these amazing new mechanical systems that I never thought could be uh, done. And I've seen these retrofit small tube applications where yeah. you can put them in the in the in the wall in the corner of the walls and all that, which sound sound great. So I think you you make a good point, and and things are rapidly uh, changing and improving. So that that's great. So. Um, my next question is for um, for Ryan. Um, I was wondering, um, in terms of the uh, passive house conversions that you're doing, um, you showed a really nice example of an existing building. Um, I think it was a, a 1990 building or later, and. Um, one of the challenges with retrofitting some of these buildings is you have these internal bathrooms. And in some of those uh, 9090 buildings, we have internal cores or ventilation units that we can bring air in there. And a lot of the older stock is even more challenging because you have these concepts of, well, the bathrooms are outside or uh, they're, they're by windows. And I, I think what was amazing about your um, retrofit solution is that by adding this ventilation on the outside, you can access uh, things uh, either way. Um, so I don't know if you can speak to that a little bit. It, it, it seems like it's kind of tackling all the different uh, building types that that we have in the multifamily arena, right? Yeah, our, our project is, is nine buildings. Uh, four of them are pre-war and uh or sorry five of them are pre-war and four are from like the late 80s and so it covers and they're all uh they're all four story walk-ups so very it probably covers most of the housing stock that you would see in brooklyn or you know maybe on like the lower east side or in the village those types of older older buildings um and yeah working from the outside does allow you to kind of bypass all the problems that you would see in trying to like run duct work and find uh, chases, you know, within the building because they they don't exist. Um, and if you start eating into square footage of those older building uh, floor plans, it can get it can get messy both for the tenants uh, and for the design team. So I think you know doing things from the outside is the way to go. Although it it really does open up another uh, series of questions, which you know when your building gets bigger you run into like lot line issues or some other issues like that, that we had to face on, on this project. Um, but I still think it's better than trying to do things. If you've got tenants in place, uh, it's easier to work from the outside, certainly. Hmm. And are there any particular areas of um, zoning or code requirements that you would like to see changed um, that would make some of these areas easier to retrofit, um, maybe you need to build over the lot line in certain situations, maybe you need to get relief on room sizes, or are, are there any things that kind of come to mind where it's been particularly challenging and you've had to either not do it or w do a big workaround? Yeah, uh, insulating over the lot line is a, huge, uh, is a huge question mark. I mean, you're essentially at the mercy of your neighbor um, both from an approval standpoint and from a cost standpoint. So they could just say no, or they could say yes, but you know the check is gonna be six figures. So um, we ran into both of those situations. We were able to design around them a little bit. Uh, luckily we didn't have uh, any buildings where we had two difficult neighbors. So we could always insulate one side and kind of make it work within the model. Um, and, and we always defer to the model. So, you know, we don't, we start at a baseline of maybe like six or eight inches of insulation and try to go down from there based on what the model tells us. But if there was uh, a better program uh, to work with neighbors um, that could be tied together in the site safety plan, uh, it's very similar. You know, you have to have all these uh, agreements with your neighbors to do site safety. So if we could roll in, uh, insulating over the lot line into those types of agreements and that legal process, I think that would be helpful. That, that's great. Thank you for that. So, uh, Jen, um, 
Thank you for your presentation. Um, I was particularly interested by one of the uh, topics you brought up about um, and the higher maintenance and operation costs uh, that could potentially be happening. And I was wondering if you could, maybe in these passive house buildings, and I, I was wondering if you could maybe elaborate on that a little bit in terms of uh, what's, what's required. I mean, some of these buildings we may want to do uh, central ERV. Sometimes we want to do uh, ERV units that are per per unit. Um, but I was I was just wondering what um, what other higher maintenance and operation costs might might be you know what concerns you might have. Right. So first, let me predicate this on the fact that there's a learning curve for a lot of this. Right. Mm -hmm. And I'm. You know, on a panel with Ryan Cassidy, Riseboro's done an amazing job of getting over that learning curve, right? So remember that the some of the barriers that I'll mention become less uh, cumbersome as building staff um, understands them better and doesn't have to face, you know, kind of these new regimes of maintenance. But and one other thing I'll say is that on my slide, I was really talking about local law 97 compliance as opposed mm -hmm. to passive house. So starting with that, with newer technologies, and we see this with developers who are new to systems that um, VRF, for instance, could have higher costs to maintain systems, particularly because like I said, it's new to building staff, right? And maybe you've got systems in place that are easily handled, you know, on site. Um, the same thing uh, with ERVs, for instance, depending on how the systems are arranged, they do require filter changes and so on. Um, again, that, that's often a totally new maintenance cost for building owners, right? Especially, and, and I think Ryan uh, addressed this in the chat, if you have ERVs in each unit, you've got to get in and you know swap out those filters three, four times a year. And maybe nobody was going into those buildings before. Um, so that's part of it is just the general maintenance of systems. I would say in terms of operational cost and energy costs, there's no question that energy costs will be drastically reduced on a passive house project. That's a fact. There are scenarios under local law uh, 97 where we believe that there will be retrofits done in the absence of deep envelope work, right? Where in fact, electricity costs could go up or sorry, energy costs could go up. The conversion from gas or even oil theoretically to VRF or other, <clears throat> other heat pump systems, right? Because if you're not controlling demand, like you would in a passive house project, mm -hmm. there is that risk. And that's really important from an affordable housing standpoint. Mm -hmm. Does that answer your question? Yeah, um, I think your point about the learning curve is really, really well taken. Um, and I think a number of us are having interesting challenges with, um, with VRF systems. And, um, you know, we have one project where the VRF system needed a, um, a software upgrade and it wasn't realized for a month or two and the data did not get sent out so there was no billing possible for two months and so there are some interesting little new challenges that we all have to become aware of with these with these systems and make sure they're all talking to one another right because a lot of times these uh, buildings have have uh, are suddenly changing their their way of working so I was wondering for um, for Ryan, in terms of um, your your kind of experience with all of these different projects and the um, the contractor knowledge, how have you found that experience with um, working with the contractors, with getting them on board, and um, seeing through a kind of an effective project? In 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 because it's so important that they understand how these uh, projects are different to regular buildings. Um, yeah, I mean, we have been doing these types of passive house buildings now for uh, nearly nearly 10 years. So I, I've seen the, the contractors go from like not really understanding it at all to 
probably everyone has at least some passive house experience, um, at least one project. So, I mean, we just center it. It's our basis of design. So we never treat it as like an add-on that a consultant has to deal with, but it's at the center of all of our design discussions. It's at the center of all of our construction negotiations. And so we never take it out. Um, so we just, we work through whatever the issues are, um, you know, whether it's windows or, or refrigerant or whatever the, the questions are. I mean, I will say some of it's just the, the contractor game. I mean, we have contractors that have built passive houses, passive houses for us in the past that come to us and tell us it costs more. And I know it doesn't because they were, you know, so some of it's just the game of cost with a contractor um, that you're always going to have to play on a deal. Um, but we, I think if you keep it centered and, and no one in the team is treating it like a, uh, an add on, uh, then you get, you can get good results. I mean, we're really fortunate in New York to have a really, um, really great industry that's responsive to these types of things. And I think uh, all the way down to the subcontractors learning curve um, that you can get buy-in if it's not viewed as something that's like additional. Sorry, I, I was on mute there. Um, thank you for that. So Ian, I have a question for you. Uh, we've known each other for a number of years. Um, we both participated on the Energy Code Advisory Panel and um, I know that you have uh, come from the private sector and you're now doing the heavy lift of uh, working on the DOB side of things. And uh, I recall that you had a lot of experience in mechanical systems and the like. And I was wondering if you had any thoughts on where we are now and what you've seen in the last five or 10 years in terms of progress in all of these different systems that we hope are going to help us um, retrofit these projects and, and there seems like a lot of room for invention in that and I was wondering if you had any any kind of thoughts uh, about this. That's a big question. Um, so I, I would say that that uh, there was actually a question in the chat sort of asked about what's the research arm and I know that um, I think Greg, Greg Hale at NYSERDA uh, you know, he hosted a bunch of roundtable meetings, and I think Ryan was at one of these meetings with us. So there's a lot of discussion about, you know, what's the state, what's the state of the equipment, and 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 what can be done with HVAC systems. So there's different answers, I think, for um, similar but different answers for commercial buildings versus residential buildings. So if we focus on residential buildings, I mean, I think that you know we've heard it today over and over again. It's VRFs and heat pumps, right? It's it's moving towards the electrification. Uh, of heating systems um, in terms of carbon reduction. Um, but I think Jen alluded to the fact that, you know, that, that comes with an, an uptick in your electric use and, and often electric cost um, that goes with that. Uh, so there's a resistance, right, because of the, of, of the, the cost of the fuels um, to go away from traditional sort of fossil fuel based heating systems and moving towards electric ones. But the technologies is, it's been out there for a long time, and there's nothing really new. I mean, VRFs, I think, are are sort of pushing the envelope um, on the HVAC side in terms of um, uh, achieving higher levels of efficiency, um, uh, higher levels of efficiency for um, uh, specific equipment. But but in general, the technology is a heat pump, right? The heat pumps have been out there for a long time, and we're just seeing more and more of it. Um, I think as the industry as a whole recognizes that carbon emissions is gonna be um, important. And that as we uh, you know, electrify heating systems, there'll be more research and development in terms of you know, higher performing, um, better quality um, uh, heat pump systems. So, uh, you know, I think there's room for improvement potentially, but I think that the equipment has been out there for a long time and it's just the application of it. Um, and, and, and getting past the, these hurdles. And I think that another question I, saw, I think I saw in the chat in terms of how do we move away from conventional natural gas? Um, one is electrifying heating systems, but also it's, it's the cost of natural gas is, is very inexpensive um, because, you know, I mean, to some degree that as a society, we don't, it doesn't include the cost of the environment and, and sort of what the, the cleanup might be. Um, but I think that, you know, if you look at the, the New York City pathway, report to a, you know, a carbon free New York City, you know, it, it, it recognizes that you know, more hydrogen, more renewable natural gas are going to become part of 
that sort of gas pipe systems. And that, that's going to increase the cost of those fuels. And, and we'll probably see more equitable sort of competition as the gas becomes less carbon intensive, the price will go up and you'll see more um, uh, better economics in terms of electrification over time. But you know, it, it's, it's an interesting new world in terms of where we're headed. I don't know if that answered the question you were asking, Stosh, but, but I think you know, it, the technology is out there, engineers know how to design around it. It's really the impetus and the desire to use those systems and move toward them. Um, you know, and there are bridge technologies because you know new construction is sort of a you have a, you have a you have a white sheet of paper and a, and a clean palette to work with. It's it's how do you do this in existing buildings um, where you're not going to do sort of a complete gut renovation if you're trying to do staged uh, renovations where you're trying to change equipment out. Um, there might be other technologies that are um, bridge technologies towards um, moving in that direction. So you might be looking at water source heat pumps. You know, still coupled with uh, fossil fuel heating um, for a period of time um, because it's the hydronics are there and, and it's maybe an easier transition. And then over time, you know, figuring out how to get the, the fossil fuel out and, and maybe continue to, to heat with, with the hydronics or a blend of uh, hybrid type systems. But, you know, every time you move some of the electric towards um, the process, you're, you're, you're alleviating some of the on site fossil fuel combustion. Right, and and a part of Local O97 Advisory Committee will be creating uh, a, a, a set of communications of recommendations of all sorts of um, information to all the professionals, owners, all of that. So that's going to be a really important part of the of the process, right? Yeah, I, mean, I think it's important, right? We, we mentioned it. I mentioned it out there that you know, outreach and assistance and education is part of the puzzle. Um, uh, uh, in terms of getting everybody up to speed in terms of where they're going. And I would say, that, you know, not even waiting for the department right now, but, you know, it's the department and the mayor's office. I mean, New York City Accelerator Program is already starting those conversations. You know, it's active and, and open and, and, you know, and folks like Jen are out there, you know, um, you know, getting the word out as well. So, I mean, it, it, you know, this is a partnership of all of the major players really doing it. I mean, BEX is involved, Urban Green, like all the different, folks that are out there, passive house, you know, these messages are not new, right? Um, you know, designing low energy buildings, obviously passive house has been advocating this for quite some time, right? So, so we know how to do it. The key has been the cost impediment, which Ryan says we, he's got knocked. So, so, you know, let's, let's get on it and get it done. Yes. Well said, well said. Okay. Uh, I have a, sorry. Go uh, on. Sorry, Stas, I'm I'm timekeeping here. So okay. uh, there's a ton of great questions coming in through the chat, and we would like participants to be able to ask their questions directly and talk to the presenters. Um, so to keep with time here, we're actually going to um, move into the breakout rooms. And thank you so much, Stas, for um, kind of starting this this uh, question asking off. And you know, there's there's a ton more kind of conversations now happening in the chat. And so I, I want to welcome everyone that's asked questions in the chat mm -hmm. to um, flag them. And what we're going to do now is we're going to set up a breakout room um, for um, Alyssa, Jen, and Ryan to actually talk in smaller groups with folks that are interested in talking to them directly. Um, each group uh, will have a moderator. And so you can um, enter those questions again in the chat. And we'll actually allow you to unmute yourself and have a conversation with the presenter and, and talk through some of these things. Um, just in terms of logistics, you're going to see a message pop up about breakout rooms, and you'll have an option to choose the breakout room you want. So make sure you go into the right room for the right person you want to talk to. And then we'll be meeting back here at 2 p.m. Um, to kind of have our, our closing thoughts and, um, and start into networking. So again, thank you so much to presenters. Thank you, Stash. Thank you, everyone on New York Passive House. And we will um, open the rooms now for breakouts. <laughs> 